Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in from different parts of the world to this brand new edition of the Afghan Tech Talk series. Today, we will be uncovering some of the magic of implementation research with Dr. Gary Aslanian. And at this point, I'd also like to uh, thank the viewers who will be watching a recorded version of this on YouTube later on. I'm positive that the YouTube algorithm did not recommend this, and you've probably searched for this actively. So a special shout out to you guys. And for all of you who don't know me as of yet, I am Dr. Manus Resta, uh, the technical coordinator of the Admin Vidax Working Group. I am a public health scientist based in uh, Kathmandu, Nepal, and I extend my warm welcome to all of you and I see that the participants are all joining in as we speak. And I just want to give you a brief background on how I came about. It's just been two months since I've joined the uh, LiveX Working Group, and you will be hearing quite a bit from me in the near future as we are planning our annual meeting in the 9th, 10th, and 11th of August. So stay tuned for that. And as such, today's webinar is a precursor to that meeting. And today we were talking about implementation research and how that is an integral part of the new trajectory the Vibex Working Group is embarking upon. But before we go any further, I would like to briefly explain the format for today's Tech Talk. As you, you might have already noticed, uh, the, the audio video functionality of the uh, attendees are unfortunately disabled, but you will be uh, able to kind of interact with us in the comments, in the comment box, in the chat box down there. And, I, and we also encourage you to put forward your questions in the separate Q&A box uh, down there. We'll, we'll, you can also upvote a question by clicking on the thumbs up button or the like button. And the questions that get, gets the most upvotes will be selected in the Q&A session to be answered by Dr. Gary. Uh, today's format is that we will start with a short introduction of the Vivex Working Group from Dr. Carolyn Lynch, the co-chair of the group. Uh, and she'll be explaining why implementation research is such an important part of our work. And then we will have the main feature presentation from Dr. Gary himself, followed by a Q&A session. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll have a quick poll to get your key inputs on some of uh, some of the things that we could actually uh, improve on in our future tech talks. So now, without further ado, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Carolyn Lynch or Kerry to say a few words about the Vivex Working Group. Kerry, up to you. Great, thanks a million, Dr. Manash, and a warm welcome to all of the attendees. Um, I'm actually standing in for Dr. Karma Lazine, our chair today. Dr. Karma is the Public Health Director of Bhutan, and as you may have seen in the news today, uh, the Bhutanese government are hard at work um, vaccinating with the second dose their entire population, so perhaps a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel for us in this region. Um, in any case, I'm very excited about this tech talk. Uh, the Atman Vivax Working Group, as you, you probably know, is one of the elder working groups. Um, of Atmen having been started uh, 10 years ago, with I see Dr. Albino is there, um, so Albino and, and uh, Professor Rick Price from Menzies. Um, and previously, the, the focus was on strengthening the link between researchers and the national programs and, and um, more on the R&D and, and figuring out what new tools could be brought on stream. At this stage, you know, over the next uh, couple of years, what we're focusing on is implementation. So we're kind of steering the ship towards more implementation and trying to figure out how can we improve uh, the current set of tools? And how feasible is, is it for us to get the, any of the new tools coming on stream down to where the caseloads are highest? What approaches can we use? And so I think this is a kind of pivotal point, really, um, to introduce implementation research. Although I, I do know that many of our, our partners have undertaken implementation research, I think for us to begin to think about it more so in our routine programming is really important. And so I'm very, very excited to have Gary with us today. And WHO TDR have a long um, history and exper experience and expertise in implementation research. And so I'm excited to, to have this introduction. 
and I do think of it as a kind of taster session um, with hopefully more collaboration as we go on through the, the next couple of years as well. So I'll stop there um, and many thanks. Looking forward to your inputs and your, your questions and thoughts about this as well. Thank you, Gary. Uh, now I have the privilege of introducing our esteemed guest, Dr. Gary Arsanian. Dr. Gary is the manager of partnership and governance at the WHO TDR, which is the WHO's special program on research and training in tropical diseases. Having joined the TDR in 2009, he is now responsible for managing a wide range of partnerships and engagement with the global health stakeholders to mobilize program resources. He also runs the governing bodies for TDR and manages the collaboration with six WHO regional offices. He is also the coordinator of an initiative of research funders known as the Essence on Health Research. And you'd be very interested to know that Dr. Gary is the host of a podcast called Global Health Matters, which you can listen to on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or any other platform of your choice. And he is also an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto's Alana School of Public Health, where he has co-founded a course on global health diplomacy. And in the past 20 years, he has taken on various roles that have allowed him to lead organizational and technical innovations and become a global leader in public health. So with such fantastic profile, we're absolutely honored to have him here today and hear his expert opinions on implementation research. Dr. Gary, over to you. Great, uh, thanks uh, for having me and uh, thanks for this uh, introduction. It's really um, great to be here and to be able to share some thoughts and experiences that we had with implementation research at this time that you're looking at um, expanding on uh, integrating that into your plan. So I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully it will all work with no problem, which it did. So just a little bit about TDR, a um, couple of words. Um, was mentioned already that we're based at WHO. We are actually also co-sponsored by um, three other global UN agencies, UNICEF that focuses on children, UNDP that focuses on overall development and World Bank, uh, which you know is a major contributor to funding, including in the health sector in many countries. So this unique uh, co-sponsored nature of TDR really over the years allowed for looking at things with multiple uh, sort of lenses and approaches and allowed for uh, results that are uh, far more reaching uh, in terms of their impact. So today I'm going to kind of give you a sense of what TDR has done or why it's been doing this uh, and focusing on implementation research that will allow you to um, kind of be more interested and follow up and look it up and uh, verify certain things or prove things that I've said might not always be true um, or not maybe working in exactly where you are because a lot of what we're talking about is very context specific. Um, in a way it is, probably um, on this kind of audience, uh, not that um, difficult to prove why uh, barriers to implementation of health interventions, and in your case, obviously around malaria, is still a major problem. But some of the things here that we uh, recently looked at uh, that kind of continues to um, reiterate the need for the focusing on this kind of approach is, um, for example, the vaccine uh, introduction of COVID-19 vaccine at the moment, and really huge number of people in um, low and middle income countries still not covered, and a lot of um, research and a lot of thinking has to go into how best to do that um, when the actual doses come and are available in, in, the, in the needed really um, numbers uh, to cover 
and get us out of uh, the pandemic. Some other examples that are quite striking that a huge number of people still continue, uh, let's say with multi-drive resistant TB, not being enrolled in treatment. And, and obviously let's say in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, a huge number of children uh, still don't have access to any kind of therapy. So this really um, uh, raises the question why um, certain things we don't know and we need to know and how best countries can really um, improve in their uh, interventions. What is implementation research? So in the last 10 years, um, uh, I have spent numerous number of uh, meetings, maybe even more than 10 years, where um, the first discussion around implementation research starts with uh, what is implementation research and what is operational research. Um, I think the first two or three years of that, I really uh, tried with many of my colleagues to go into that rabbit hole and kind of look at it and say, okay, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? And then we realize that that really is a waste of time in a way that at the end of the day, it's what is being done or why we choose a certain term over the other term. There's been a lot of things written about it in terms of definitions and review of different approaches. Um, uh, I, if, if needed, I'm happy to find more uh, references to that. But really at the end of the day, it is a, a systematic approach to understanding and addressing barriers uh, to implementation of health interventions, strategies, and policies. And a lot of that is in the context of a country, a region, um, part of a country, a community within a country, and or um, certain kind of um, intervention that's been started a long time ago or is being introduced, et cetera, et cetera. So, the difference with operational research is that it really uses routine data that is available. So uh, from the operations or implementation of a health program that really can be used and analyzed and provide additional insight into what is going on in the intervention. Um, both of them are conducted within a real life setting in a health system or community setting or in certain parts of the country and, and can employ different types of research methodologies, qualitative, quantitative, sometimes um, anthropological, sometimes statistics, health economics, and can really bring different types of research methodologies to answer the questions in hand. And at the end of the day, what is it for? It's to provide that evidence uh, really authoritarian evidence based on uh, some results that this is what the problem is and we have to really change the policy or we have to change the course uh, in order for us to achieve something. Obviously, this is a very simplified and quick uh, introduction to this uh, and, and really at the end of the day, one message to leave you with out of this is um, the... Um, the terms don't matter. What is the question and what do we want to do? That's what matters and what is the answer we want to get out of it. TDR has been doing a lot of um, uh, sort of product development for years and, and also a lot of uh, trial support and maybe called the original public-private partnership because we had a lot of industry also involved in the last, you know, close to 50 years. But at the moment, um, our focus is on um, using the science of solutions to transform um, the delivery of um, health interventions with really a uh, final destination being um, improved uh, health. So we do that in three different ways um, by strengthening capacity uh, doing and supporting research for implementation and engaging globally at various um, initiatives to make a difference. TDR is a very small um, 
secretariat or a program. We do um, the last estimate a couple of years ago when we look at it, we work, we work with about 900 people and or researchers or policymakers or implementers um, uh, around the world. So uh, don't be um, uh, fooled by a small number. TDR staff is small and it doesn't do everything. And that's not really the goal of our program. Uh, it's those 900 people or more or less, depending on the year, but around that number that it really is um, engaged and, and um, gets, the, um, uh, gets the actual um, things and, and gets the actual work done and achieves those results. Why did TDR change its mind about five or six years ago? Um, mainly, uh, obviously, from the realization that while we were working on trying to kind of cross that uh, bridge, and, and I think Dr. Lynch already mentioned this um, in terms of go, how to um, go from basic research to products and then into next phase, but kind of um, uh, jumping that next uh, value of this in a way of um, how to scale up and pilot and use and then um, actually um, uh, apply some of the best um, so no, best um, supported and, and solutions that have, have the best evidence behind them. Um, and, and that was really why we switched from them. Uh, I think this is partly why um, I heard from, from, from your uh, current plans of looking at that, I felt maybe it would be uh, appropriate to reflect that we have not always been looking at this uh, in this way. Uh, and we have uh, obviously found um, that kind of a niche for us uh, to support. And that's also what we heard from public health practitioners and, and, and those who are working in actual health systems and, and in, in public health systems uh, globally. In a way, um, the number of activities that uh, are focused on capacity are probably number one um, way to look into that and 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 uh, without having a proper uh, cadre or proper number of people and if these are not um, you know university professors or um, those researchers who work in universities these are people who are working uh, in um, in countries you don't have to be um, you know, uh, affiliated with university to be involved in this and, and, and get to better understand approaches in implementation research uh, to actually do it. You could work with the um, academic and, and both ways or academics can work with the policymaker or implementer, uh, uh, but, but that by no means our goal is to support only um, or work with uh, only uh, and those who are in academic world. So uh, if there was one um, sort of reflection out of this is that everyone uh, who is in the health system can and should be um, um, looking at implementation research as a tool to deliver um, uh, the public health goals uh, in front of us. So there are a number of ways we do this. Um, uh, for, for example, we have grants that are in small scale, and we work with regional offices in, I guess, in, in Asia Pacific, that would be in Western Pacific in Southeast Asia, where these kinds of questions of uh, what is happening in the region, why are we not getting to um, certain goals of elimination of in neglected tropical diseases, or in TB, uh, or other um, diseases, or uh, in terms of um, certain policies that are not being implemented. So these questions are put out there and researcher and a policymaker or a team apply and within 12 months of the project, they actually produce an answer. And sometimes uh, by doing, they also uh, learn how to do it. So that's one example. And we, are, we have training uh, supported in uh, seven universities in different regions of the globe that train people 
in master's level, uh, not PhD, but master's, but they focus on implementation research in their thesis and, and then some others. And for, for, for lack of time, I will not go into each one of them, but just to give you a sense. And this is fundamental in terms of um, to do that uh, kind of implementation research, we do need to better understand um, uh, or be uh, uh, sort of um, trained or get that knowledge if, if we don't have one. And that knowledge can be used in um, other settings for other um, uh, sort of problems. For example, we one of our programs sorted uh, that focused on structured operation research training and research um, first focused on TB and then other diseases um, at the time of pandemic about um, you know a huge number of them up to 73 percent use the skills they've gotten through that sorted program in the COVID response and and this was really what they told us with actual examples how they did it uh, so just if you pick one um, example uh, of going through a program where how to use data or how to interpret data, how to ask questions for implementation research and operation research, help them in a time when the health system was demanding answers and health systems and, and public was demanding a better uh, um, answers from um, as you know, policymakers and public health authorities. And these people stepped in and used their knowledge in this um, time of the pandemic. So a kind of transferable, transferability of implementation research skills or operation research skills is what I'm talking about here, that it's not about one disease, it's more about answering questions and using different research tools to answer questions. So that sorted program is um, one example. And here we have a um, number of countries and people who were frontline health workers in the driving seat of that program. And, and I do want to uh, really reiterate this is that people who were in those uh, sorted programs and I've uh, helped with some of them directly um, with the uh, person who is managing this and people who are managing this um, to really uh, get a better sense and, and had a, an experience where, you know, disease control um, uh, um, sort of program um, experts in the country uh, and NGOs and also others have come together with a possibly a researcher or statistician or an economist and they propose this um, a program, uh, a question, then they use this sorted approach of different um, 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 sort of stages of identifying, gathering data and, and sort of analyzing the data and then interpreting the data. Most of the sorted is using actually data available, own data in the countries to do research um, and answer the questions that they have they don't have to go and get that data. They use some of what they have uh, comparing, you know, different parts of the country or comparing different variables, asking questions, doing analysis, and then using their own data. In a way, in fact, uh, one other interesting outcome of that has been that um, it really had um, some, some of the people who were working, uh, starting asking questions about their own data and, and availability of it or quality of it and because they started treating it in a different way. So an interesting outcome that really also helped in um, um, sort of country discussions around the need for better data, routine data, because you may want to use it to do uh, research and answer some questions. Uh, an example uh, for you, um, as you are thinking around malaria in the region, is, for example, use of that approach uh, on antimicrobial resistance. Um, just shows you that it can be used for various issues. Um, and here, a few countries were, um, were involved in this particular sorted 
and, and, and then questions from these countries around AMR uh, and also what um, questions around national plans about antimicrobial resistance were really put uh, uh, in front of them. And in a very short period of time of year and a half or two, uh, you know, 183 people were trained through those tools, uh, conducted the studies and published 23 uh, articles. And article publishing is not a goal, it's just a measure. Uh, the goal is that they've actually answered questions that many of these um, programs had. In this case, the AMR plan in the country and the people who worked at the AMR uh, antimicrobial research plan for the country were the ones who were really putting the question forward. I already talked about some of the tools um, and this is just quickly to go through this. Um, some of them are online uh, and they're done in various languages. Uh, there's an IR toolkit that gives you uh, a chance to go through uh, seven different modules uh, to develop uh, your research plan and, and, and answer some of the questions around how and what to engage and how what to use and, and then how to communicate your results and how to work on making sure that it's actually integrated into the health system. And the last one is around ethics. Uh, sometimes uh, training course um, for uh, com ethics committees and this is sometimes an issue in some of the countries where ethics committees take too long or um, may not understand the implementation research, but it really um, training for that is useful to also help with um, doing the implementation research ethically uh, and, and timely uh, in, in a way. Another example uh, from TB, um, where uh, we're supporting, and, and again, uh, this is very small, by no means I can cover this in, in a short presentation, just to, of West African countries in, engaged in this program um, that is focused on TB. And, and the pandemic really had an impact in terms of uh, the, uh, um, the pace with which um, these countries were already tackling TB and, and then uh, research programs were put into place to uh, answer some of the questions that these countries had. For example, I'll quickly switch to this um, in Burkina Faso, a West African country. Um, the average time between the onset of TB symptoms and the first health uh, consultation has uh, increased by 70% since uh, pandemic um, because uh, obviously the health system was telling people to stay at home because of pandemic. And then if you have a cough, don't come, call, and depending where you are, obviously, and which, which country and health system you are, but these were some of the things. And um, the questions around why and how can um, these um, wait times be reduced uh, these are the questions It's one of these 11 projects going on right now, uh, because we really know that uh, while we need to fight the pandemic and get the public health going with vaccines and other measures, uh, other diseases, in this case, TB is still going to be there and it's still there and it's not getting any better. So we have to actually do better and understand uh, better. And there is a tool that was developed, a digital tool uh, for um, implementation research on TB. Again, any of this, I'm going very fast. Uh, if you're interested, I'm going to um, more than happy to reach out to colleagues, put you in touch and you can discuss further and on the details. Um, if we are looking at a currently use of uh, IR for vaccines, and implementation and introduction of vaccines. I mentioned that we are co-sponsored by UNDP and we UNDP, we have a joint program on access and delivery. And that program really quickly switched to help countries um, in mainly in Africa, but also in Syria, 
uh, to um, introduce some implementation research programs to use digital, digital technology uh, in terms of uh, how to monitor safety of uh, COVID vaccine in, uh, introduction in these countries. Most of them get that from COVAX facility. Uh, so um, now um, about nine countries plus in Africa and one in Middle East, uh, Syria, are engaged in this process and using um, this uh, approach to uh, have a real life information about uh, introduction of COVID vaccines. It can also be used um, in vector-borne disease uh, and climate change um, in a way. Um, it all comes down to really uh, um, how, um, let's say in this case, they used uh, one health approach. And, and, and if you're engaging uh, people, uh, animals, plants, their shared environment, and then diseases like uh, uh, malaria, for example, here in one of the one of the parts in in Kenya, um, it really needed to have sort of that multi-sectoral approach into um, uh, pr pr infection control and you know um, expand the understanding uh, in these parts of uh, in this part of Kenya. So and the same uh, with um, with schistosomiasis and, and Rift Valley fever and other neglected tropical diseases that are really on the um, really um, animal, human health and climate change and impact on that. Um, you may have heard a lot about community and social innovation and introduction of that. Here is an example from uh, Bangladesh and India uh, where um, really um, specifically some community efforts were put, but research was not, not done in, in around that. So um, research um, um, in, uh, in a way allowed to evaluate the effectiveness of some of these community-based interventions and their sustainability and, and not seeing this as a one-off or two-off uh, a, a sort of lack in terms of we achieved this, but that innovation now has a proof because um, through this social innovation in health initiative, we were able to um, help answer some of the questions and then they are actually equipped with evidence what works and what not work, what doesn't work and they can actually expand or build on that. So I've, I think I've covered already uh, these tools. There's another one on gender and, and gender analysis comes really into play for certain diseases, like let's say for TB, we know men are more in risk and have more um, issues around TB. So looking at a disease with a gender analysis and intersexual um, sort of approach helps um, to better understand and, and, and devise or uh, ask the question around your implementation research question or your system question in that way uh, with that kind of analysis. And I, obviously this depends on disease and settings, et cetera, but we have this um, web, web best tool that is also being used uh, for that kind of analysis. Um, Essence on Health Research was mentioned, and this is um, a group of funders, and I'm only mentioning this because funders also need to understand, and they do now increasingly, and about 41 funders are part of this Essence uh, program that actually I am the secretariat in helping them uh, work on this. So uh, the, uh, there is a document in 2020 um, uh, produced a good practice document for funders um, how to invest in implementation research. So these funders are really uh, various in their nature. Uh, they are research councils or development agencies and others. But if, if you have a chance to look at these approaches um, in terms of investing, you will see what a funder might be interested in or should be interested in. And what we as, uh, let's say, health professionals working in the system or researchers working with the a uh, public health system can also get out of that. And finally, a huge amount of uh, money 
in many uh, low uh, and middle income countries still comes from funders from outside or they are part of a health program in the country. So this issue uh, very briefly, um, we, um, can, we should look at because this is where also um, the need for the answers comes uh, because you want to achieve some of the goals set by you know, these external funders and internal funders, but then um, sometimes it's not that easy. So um, really no uh, public health program, be that external and in, in, internal, can no longer probably afford not to include some kind of research uh, because um, you know, um, the results, if we're not getting results year after year or they are really stagnant, uh, that is not really going to be answered without some kind of research. Um, so we we'll actually have done some studies uh, working with countries who receive uh, external funding. There is generally understanding of, um, of why uh, these programs should uh, include um, you know, research, um, but, but the capacity sometimes is not there or uh, maybe sort of a myth or misunderstanding between the funder and the, uh, the country, what can be really uh, included. So um, general advice is that um, the, the, some of the funders may not, uh, global funded others may not give you guidance on this, but if you ask, uh, they will think about it. So if we wait for them to give us guidance, they may never give that to us because they may never know that that's what we need to include in our proposal or in our approach. Um, and, and, and then also, uh, we also have this thing that, uh, you know, budgets cannot be uh, changed or uh, ad hoc introduction of OIR or IR into the program is not possible, but it is, it is probably the only way to know is to try, and, and it is always possible. If you can show that by doing this, you're going to achieve um, a better result, um, unlikely um, uh, you, I mean, it, I'm not guaranteeing it, but a funder will have to listen to that. Um, and of course, uh, strength and capacity, um, because that really comes down to that. And, and a lot of times, um, these proposals don't include uh, to these groups um, because the capacity is not in the ministry, it's in the university. But as I said earlier, uh, it doesn't need to be in, in those places. It can actually be in the public health uh, sector and, and, and use these tools and other tools available out there uh, to um, equip uh, the public health system with uh, doing that kind of research. I think I've come down to the last slide. So I will stop sharing. I hope I have kept to relatively to time. Um, Thank you, Dr. Kerry, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, you have given us a lot of food for thought, you know, and opened our minds on what implementation can be done. Uh, research can be done. And I hopefully there will be some implementation research being born out of this webinar. And one day we'll get to hear or read about them, you know. So, and I particularly agree to your point that we need to equip ourselves with implementation research skills. And through that lens, we'll be able to see the issues in implementations more clearly and in a more systematic manner. So I guess that is one takeaway message that we have to have that lens on. Okay. And now, uh, with your permission, I would like to go ahead with the Q and A session. I already okay, sure. see some there. There are some uh, questions coming up in the Q and A uh, box there. Uh, but before I go to the most asked questions, I would like to start with one of mine. And I think this will be on uh, most of the audience's mind is that you've touched on many parts, many aspects of implementation research on COVID, on tuberculosis, on on antimicrobial resistance, but how can we use implementation research more readily in the malaria world, given that we have issues such as patient adherence, uh, healthcare worker compliance, quality of training, to name a few. Uh, what do you suggest to the implementers so that they can formulate their research questions for implementation research? Right. 
Um, thanks for that. And obviously, this is on the minds of uh, colleagues who are tuning in today. So obviously, it's very hard to generalize and kind of, um, I mean, it's uh, the, the thing with implementation research, a lot of that is really context specific. So um, the research question or implementation research uh, question is really going to come out of what is your problem? Like you're a public health uh, practitioner, you're in charge of the malaria program, and uh, year after year, you're having some adherence issues, you're having numbers are not going in the right direction. So what is the problem, right? So that you start with that and also um, what are the kind of um, um, results from your work that you feel they're not really achieving what you said to achieve. And then, then you would say, okay, um, I hear, I mean, some, some sort of preliminary reflection around that and also discussing with those involved. Um, uh, you're hearing about certain issues in, in certain parts. Uh, there is issue with adherence here. There's the issues and here is there. There is uh, that kind of bottleneck there. This is too far. So gather that information and, 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 and put that into kind of uh, array of problems that you're facing with and not only you as a person but also your program and then and then hypothesize uh, you, some some of it you could hear from uh, your uh, grapevine of people talking well I know this is not happening because of this or I know it's not happening because our protocol is too complicated that you know that questionnaire we give them is really wrong or is not about what we want to ask them. So gather all of that and then, and then sort of you have to kind of put that into um, uh, in front of you and say, so is the problem this or is it that? Okay, let's, that's your question. Is, 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 I mean, again, it's really hard to kind of generalize, but it really is going to turn that into that question. They're gonna say, the problem is, let's say, a lack of digital um, and, and adherence and lack of use of digital technology. And if we were doing this on a smartphone, we would get a better result because of this, this and that. Okay, that's your question. And then, then you go and, and, and kind of say, so what kind of method I can use? Am I going to do a survey? Am I going to look at the data? Am I going to look at the questionnaires? And I'm going to look at that. What kind of data I'm going to look at to see if I can answer this question. So, um, um, I mean, if we had, if we had an issue, maybe we could spend, you know, two days uh, brainstorming about the research question. But I'm giving you a sense um, and a little bit of a, um, a taste of it. Important thing is, one person cannot answer or come up with this. You have to look at all involved. You may have to ask the people who are really impacted, um, not everyone, but few of them, and validate your question. Is this really true or not? And then you uh, kind of uh, narrow down one or two questions you want to answer. Thank you for that. You know, you, I think this reiterates your point that we don't have to be a university researcher to think about implementation research, right? And most exactly. of us, right? if you can think about how to improve the quality of implementation, and then we can think about the questions themselves. Thank you so much for that. And I am now, I see there's many questions being upvoted and I'll, I think I'll just randomly pick them, okay? And this one is from uh, Melody uh, from MMV. And she asked, Dr. Gary, how do we ensure that implementation research is prioritized by external funders to support the programs that is under the pressure of implementation, how can we ensure that there's enough time and reflection given to implementation research to improve the quality of implementation more broadly? I know you touched this in your presentation a bit, right. but let's hear from you a bit more. Right, right. So one of the things that, um, I mean, we've really um, tried to do with this Essence Initiative is kind of to bust this kind of myth that um, funder is this unpenetrable 
unchangeable uh, deaf kind of uh, place that does not listen. I think if we um, look at the goals of any funder, be that a research funder or a sort of health uh, program funder, fund, global fund or Gavi or whatever is there out there that we um, use uh, funding to, they're, they're really their goal is to achieve results. So if we can actually um, formulate, you know, our, an, our ask in, a, in, a, in those terms, uh, that this is not, um, we're not asking uh, for funding to do research for the sake of research, but our ask is to uh, achieve the goals that we have set in front of us. And uh, this formulation is immediately going to change the kind of discussion you're going to have. Um, I was uh, really, um, uh, recently I was uh, interviewing someone for a podcast for, from Gavi, and, 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 and I remembered about 12 or 15 years ago, um, the board of Gavi was really not interested in uh, implementation research. And the answer they have kept up giving, giving us and me was that um, really the, we don't, we're not in the business of funding research. And then we immediately changed the language because we had to say, uh, this is not about research. We're not doing research for the sake of research. Okay, what are you doing? Okay, we're trying to, you know, use this uh, for introduction of rotavirus. And if you look at, you know, that, or after that, there was a malaria virus introduction, let's say in Ghana. So we need implementation research for that. Um, so it's not about research. So the way you have to kind of formulate that with funders. And, and, and I'm glad when I mentioned that talking to someone for, for, for an episode the other day uh, from Gavi, that in fact, now they are doing some of it. So formulate your ask in terms of this is for achieving the result rather than I want to do research. I think that would be very beneficial to think, like, think of it like that, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, this is from Kimi. And the question is, uh, with a great deal of pressure to deliver results quickly, in implementation, how do we factor in ethics? And the time that if we need to get ethical approval and even uh, like ethical implementation research, does it need ethical approval or not? Well, anything that involves people needs technical approval. So there's no question about that. Obviously the rules are the same uh, in a way there is really no issue around it. Um, so, depends like for example for operational research some of it that they use routine data that is unqualified uh, kind of faceless in terms of the name and and everything around that data or the person um, then some of it if it's um, you know privacy by design in your health data then maybe you can actually get an exemption uh, from that if you're purely using available uh, data that you have in your system. So you may very quickly get an exemption for that. However, it is an issue of um, trying to present your implementation research in a way to the ethics approval uh, that really is understood and really shows this, um, that the people are going to really um, gain from this and you're not gonna sort of harm people in the way one way or the other. So you do, need a, you do need an ethics, but you need to kind of present it in a way uh, that is understood. And, and as you saw in one of the tools that we had uh, for ethics is not only for people, but also for ethics committees. Uh, so we have like a network of ethics committees, but we're also trying to work and help them to actually be able to review implementation research proposals because they've seen a lot of randomized controlled trials. Um, they've seen around uh, other kind of testing of drugs, et cetera, uh, that they actually look at it with their different lens. So um, there are some tools and, and, and again, if needed, we can look at that and, and share with you uh, that really uh, give some guidance how to go about submitting uh, for ethics approval and having that quickly. 
um, yeah, for implementation research, where you can maintain the, 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 the main sort of, you, you do need to make sure that what you're doing is ethical and does not harm or um, have, um, have really benefiting, of the work is benefiting, but it also can be done quickly. I hope I help. It, it is really, um, it, it is an issue that really needs um, um, uh, uh, really some digging and finding some guidance and, and using that and, and can actually help. I think uh, most of our audience would uh, would love to have that access to that kind of resource. Mm. So if you could just mm -hmm. provide us at the end of the webinar, yeah, uh, we'd yeah. love to get to see them. And now this is uh, another question. It is actually an, from an anonymous attendee, and they ask, uh, "Can you provide a contact on how we can work with the TDR to provide training to our country partners? For example, master's level postgraduate training." Uh, or you could have some funding to support training, or if you, if you support evaluation of pilot projects. A lot of questions on funding, actually. Please. Okay, okay, sure. Um, and and then um, I mean the 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 beauty of anonymous is that I don't know where you are, but um, just to say that in your region, actually, we do support in in the in two um, universities um, in Bangladesh through BRAC, and also through. Uh, Gajamada University in Indonesia masters programs that focus on implementation research. Uh, so, um, I mean, obviously, anyone in the region can apply. This is not only for those two countries, but um, those from uh, anywhere in what is WHO, Western Pacific, and Southeast Asia uh, region can apply for these things. So, that's currently. Uh, in a way, what we uh, have um, uh, supporting. I also I already mentioned some uh, grants on implementation research that we've been doing with uh, the regional offices and, and, and some champions there who really uh, work on uh, calling for this, but also uh, making sure that the projects really are used um, there. So keep an eye for those calls. Uh, from regional offices in conjunction with TDR. We also have a regional training center in um, Indonesia in, at the, again, Gajamada University that offer um, these um, massive online courses or short courses and ethics courses for IR. Um, so that's um, actually done. We have a new regional training center in Malaysia uh, new meaning this year, um, um, they have uh, started. We um, used to work with um, an institution in, in the Philippines in the past. So these are, uh, again, um, TDR is a small program, but these are our partners in your region uh, where uh, some of these tools on implementation research is available. Um, and we are uh, working with them to work with countries. So uh, keep an eye for those because they have opportunities. Yeah. Thank you for that key bit of information for our audience. And now this is the most upvoted question of all, okay, right now. And Ritika asks, is there any implementation research you know of around pharmacovigilance? Uh, she says she, she, she sees it for COVID-19, but what, benefit us to also investigate the strength of these systems for Vivax malaria. So have you seen right. any? Right. Um, so I'm, I may have not prepared a thought for that it's just simply because I have not looked at specifically um, the, like for pharmacovigilance, but we have examples um, that I could uh, look uh, for if, if needed, but um, perhaps the, I mean, it, it does not need to be about um, malaria. Let's put it this way. That's my quick answer. It has to be looked at, okay, they're using this pharmacovigilance, let's say for other entities or for introduction of uh, other, uh, let's say, I don't know, sleeping sickness or you pick it. It doesn't really matter what it is. And, and we can look that up if, if needed and share with you. 
is what are the methods that they used and, and what have, have been um, uh, kind of been uh, the results. Yes, so uh, the access and delivery partnership that I mentioned um, that is helping countries to introduce um, true um, different kind of changes in the country, uh, new uh, tools or un unused tools, but it also comes with pharmacovigilance program uh, to give the evidence. So how is it going? So um, ADP, um, if we look that up, um, it is uh, actually uh, run out of Bangkok uh, in Thailand and ADP program has various examples of research that they funded for pharmacovigilance of introducing you know, a whole uh, gamut of, um, you know, uh, sort of new tools and, and with uh, pharmacovigilance to support it one way or the other. So I hope it helps. Yeah, it does help. And keeping the track of time, I think we are almost towards the end of our every webinar. Uh, but I would like to encourage our audience to follow Dr. Gary on Twitter and also listen to his podcast. So maybe you could tell us some, something about your podcast so that people can actually listen to. Okay, sure. <laughs> so the podcast is called Global Health Matters. And we have realized that, um, you know, global health uh, issues are out there sometimes, but not always in this medium. And we realized that a huge number of people are seeking that kind of information. And it can be quite um, impactful in terms of that, uh, particularly for um, sort of um, voices and, and different global voices coming together. So we've launched this uh, for a one a month episode. Um, it started in April. We hope to have 10 episodes this year. Um, we're catching up to make sure we have 10 in a year. Uh, and it really ranges from uh, including implementation research. There will be one episode coming up uh, focusing the, the use of implementation research for public health, but um, topics mm -hmm. like women in science or use of social innovation or um, equitable partnerships and, you know, decolonization of global health. Uh, so that's a really broad range of uh, issues. Uh, one other one that I already talked to Dr. Lynch earlier is that elimination versus eradication is a question that time up a lot in, in the debate uh, around that. We might look at that in the future. So if you have any suggestions for topics, uh, please do uh, send that to us. Uh, when you find the podcast website, you'll know how to do that. Uh, so really that's, um, um, that's uh, very exciting. And we have already thousands of uh, downloads uh, so far. Some of them are from me actually. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> so, well, this has been a very interesting and an eye-opening webinar for, for all of us. And I'm sure we've learned something and developed a taste for implementation research today. Uh, I'd like to now kindly request all the participants to fill out the, the quick poll that is at the bottom of the screen. If you could just take 30 seconds to answer a few questions, that will help us immensely in improving our tech talk experience going forward. And just as uh, we all do that. Yep, we, we're having some, some answers coming up. Uh, yep. I feel conflicted in answering any of them. <laughs> yeah, let's see if some of the attendees can now see the questions coming in their screen. Yes. Yeah. And I think with that, I would like to thank all of the participants and the attendees for engaging with us till the end and helping us have a very productive webinar. Uh, special thanks to you, Dr. Gary, for taking time off your busy schedule and you know enlightening us with your expert opinions. Um, 
And on behalf of the uh, IVEX Working Group, I would also like to pay my gratitude to the admin secretariat, particularly Dr. Von Behind, who's been the backbone of organizing this tech talk. Uh, so at the end, I think we have we have got uh, the answers in the poll. So so that's almost done. Um, so thank you. I guess this is about it. Thank so you, Manash, I was just going to say thank you to everyone's quest for everyone's questions that we didn't answer. Uh, questions around funding, how to link up with WHO TDR and collaborate with you, Dr. Gary. Um, and examples on methods used in implementation research. We're going to make sure that all that um, information is available on the AtMen website. And also perhaps we can follow up with you again, Dr. Gary, and we're doing some prioritization of questions uh, across the region so we can um, maybe make sure that we get you back to, to talk about specific questions that um, the national sure. programs have themselves in terms of their implementation. So many thanks um, for the questions that haven't been answered. We, we'll definitely get back to you. Thank you. Yeah. We'll send them to Dr. Gray and probably get the answers from you as well. <laughs>